Okay, good morning everyone. And uh, today we'll uh, continue uh, the discussion about uh, objects and functions in, uh, in JavaScript uh, that will bring us from a basic knowledge to some uh, more advanced usage of functions uh, after today and next week's uh, discussion. Okay, it will be uh, where we finish this a uh, uh, quick uh, tour through the main uh, JavaScript functionalities. Uh, last week uh, we were talking about uh, closures, okay? So to understand them better, I try to prepare a very short example here. Okay, just uh, uh, the same idea that we were discussing, but it's a bit more polished, of a simple function that uses uh, closures in this way. Now, what are we doing here? I'm creating a function here, I call it power eyes, whatever, that uh, returns a function, right? Uh, and this function is defined uh, in line with a narrow syntax, but this is not a requirement, can be defined with any of the valid syntaxes. Um, that is defined here and returned as a result. Okay, so from the point of view of the language, what we are doing is that we are creating an object here. Sorry, on the right here, we are creating an object, we are setting a reference to this object, and we're returning that reference. That object happens to be a function. That's easy. In the definition of the function, so imagine here we have a classical function definition with this arguments, and the arguments, of course, are used inside the function, which is normal. But inside the body of the function, we are using some library function, okay. We are also using this variable exponent. That, in this case, is not defined inside the inner function, but it's a local variable to the outer function. In this case, it's a parameter, but parameter, function parameters and local variables are the same, okay, from the point of view of the scope, of their scope. So normally, when we and finish the execution of this function, this variable, which this reference will be lost, okay? It refers to something throughout the execution of the function. This reference is alive, we can use it, and at the closing brace, normally all local resources are destroyed. That's it, normal. And this would be the case if we didn't uh, return anything, return this function. Since we are returning this object, it's a function, inside the function definition, there are still some references to external values. So imagine the object being pointed by the exponent, like in a no, reference. Uh, that object cannot be destroyed because it still has its reference. This reference comes from inside this function, and this function is saved somewhere, okay? So I'm saving a reference to a function that inside contains a reference to a variable that was defined in a scope that is no longer valid. In a way, when we define this function, we are taking a snapshot of the current reference and storing it inside our function. Not the current value because the value may change but the reference to that object uh, is uh, saved. If we call this uh, power eye function many times with different parameters, every time we create this function, it will be a new function, a different one, that will remember a different reference to a different object that would be the current value of this uh, um, parameter. So what I'm doing here is I'm calling this power function with an argument of two. And so I'm creating here a function that takes a base and computes the power of that base to the exponent of two. And uh, I return this function and I store in this function with the name square. Just notice that I'm returning the function name I'm not calling the function, okay? It would be a mistake of calling the function in this way because that would 
call the function and return the result value of the function itself. Okay, so that's not what we want. By the way, by the way, we don't know the base yet. The base will be known only later on. And so also here, I'm storing the result of this function, which is a function, into a variable. And this variable contains a reference to a function. So it's an object that can be called, that supports the function call operator, like here. So square is not a function that I defined, but it's a function that was built for me by the powerize function. This function contains, requires, okay, n is the base of the exponentiation and remembers the exponent from the creation time of that function. Okay? And so this works as expected. If I run it, of course, it will print uh, all the Let's have a look. I created the square, the cube, and the square root. And I'm printing them for the first time natural numbers. And I have the 4, uh, the square is 16, the, the cube is 64, and the square root is 2 of the base uh, 4. So the first column is the base, and, and the other columns are the different functions. So I'm sort of a function factory, a function that creates other functions that retain some information about when they were created, okay? The, these functions are, are stored somewhere as objects, uh, and they retain this uh, closed argument, this closure over this object, okay? So this is the basic mechanism. We can exploit in some way this mechanism for uh, emulating uh, intelligent objects. So we are used, okay, in JavaScript, we already know that we open the brace and we define an object. But uh, um, that object only has, it's a map, it's a dictionary, key value. It doesn't have operations, it doesn't have methods, okay? So how can we emulate this mechanism for creating something that contains data, contains state, and also has some operation. Well, we can do that by exploiting this mechanism, by creating an object, and uh, in, in, inserting into that object uh, the um, methods that operate on a closure of the value. Let's unpack this sentence, okay? So uh, let's uh, open another file. Uh, let's, uh, let's call it object. The JS. Okay. So imagine I want to in our example where we are well, uh, emulating a, a website of comments, uh, we want to store or create an object that uh, represents uh, a comment over a response over the question, okay? So there will be maybe a text and a score. Let, let's make it simple, a string and a number, right? So I want to create, uh, it's easy because I, I just need to create some objects that look like uh, uh, text uh, something, and uh, uh, score five stars, or whatever, okay? Um, one response uh, can be an object like that, okay? Okay, this would be a, um, a way of creating a next object, an object with only properties. We want to add also Maybe some uh, operations of them. Maybe the operation for setting the score or for, I don't know, uh, polishing the text uh, or whatever. Okay? I don't care. So how can we do that? We could uh, create uh, a function that returns an object that will contain the properties 
and the operations on them. So like uh, a function create response, for example, that will get two parameters, uh, which is the text uh, and the score, for example. Okay. And uh, it will return an object initialized with those values. So I'm just making an intermediate step. So I already find an object where I have a property text that I initialize with uh, uh, the text that I received as a parameter and the score property that I initialize with the score that I received as a parameter. So the second argument is, of course, uh, the variable, the value of this variable. The first uh, argument here is the name of the property, right? And at the end, I will return this object. I didn't do anything special right now. I want to add some function to this object. So now the object is called obj. And so I could add uh, maybe a function for increasing the score. Well, it's easy because I just have to add a new property on the object, dot increase score. It's easy to add a new property to an object. This property would be a function that in this case takes no parameter, but increases the score. So I don't take any parameter. And the body of this function would be just of increasing score equal to obj.score plus one. Or plus plus, or however you want. So you see that I'm defining a function here that works uh, on obj. So it has a closure on this object. It's a local variable. And instead of returning this function, I'm returning the object that contains the function that holds a reference, a closure, over the object itself. I couldn't write this definition here because the reference to obj is not yet defined inside these braces. So first I need to create the object and then I can refer to it, okay? We'll find, <laughs> we'll see a syntax later for. So, does it work? It, let's try. So we can create a response. Uh, so const response one create an, a response uh, with text ABC and score three, and the const uh, response two, create response with text XYZ and score two. Console.log R1, R2. So let's see if the objects are created first. Yes, but I don't see the so the output window. So it should not be open automatically. CD week two. Not the objects. Okay, so what we see here, I don't know why it didn't open the terminal automatically. Uh, I'm printing two objects. The first object is ABC3, and it contains a reference to a function uh, called uh, increase score. And the second this is the second object here. What happens if we increase the score of R1? So R1 dot increase score. It's a function, so I, we need to call it with braces. And if we print them again, we see that the first function 
as the, as the first object as the score increased to four, and I just wanted to check that the second object didn't change. So the function increase score increases the score of the object to which it's bound. It remembers that specific object. Every time I call a function, the uh, create response function, it will create a new object and a new function for increasing the score of that specific object. So it's a customized version of a function that only works with that object, with that object instance. So there's no confusion, okay? About which object gets, uh, gets modified by this increased score. So this is a mechanism that uh, can be used to create uh, functions that create objects that we can store, and these objects have some operations defined in front of them. Um, the strange thing is that, and the reason why we don't call this a, a function, uh, an object method or something like that, is that this function is not really part of the object. When we create this function here on the right hand side of, uh, of this assignment, uh, we are just creating any function. So there's not it's not inside the braces of the object. So in JavaScript, functions are just outside objects. Uh, this is special because when we create that, we are borrowing some information, some reference from the context in which they are created. But it's not really part of the of the uh, um, of the object itself. Hmm? Okay, there is a. Simplified version of this uh, procedure. So a function for creating objects that may be rich objects also. Okay? And so uh, this uh, other syntax is called the constructor functions. So the same result that we have here, we can replicate uh, by creating a, so let's do the same using constructor function. What is a constructor function with the S, constructor? It's in the slide, but it's, but <laughs> it's easier to see it in the code. But the purpose of a constructor function is that what we saw. But it's made in a more structured way, okay? Um, we define it as a normal function. Let's use the, the extended syntax, okay? And uh, by convention, a constructor function starts, uh, the name of the constructor function starts with a capital letter. So response. And then it can take some parameters, uh, new text, uh, score. A constructor function doesn't need to have a return statement. It's not needed. And a constructor function is called with a, with a keyword which is new. So what, what we are doing is uh, we are building our tree as a new response with the text uh, S and score one. So there's a slightly different syntax in calling constructor functions. They are calling them with the new keyword. So it's a, it looks like a regular function call, but it also like, looks like an object creation if a, a response was a class. So it, it's both of them. This new keyword will create a new object. This new object uh, at the creation time has no properties. And the role of the constructor function is to fill in the property that we need. And this object has a predefined name, which is this. So inside the body of a constructor function, we already have a keyword, this, 
refers to the object that has already been created by the new operator, by the mechanism of function call. And so we can put into the, this object a property called text with the text of the, of the my parameter. We can put a score with a score and we can put a function uh, increase score as a, a normal function where this dot score plus plus. Sorry, brace. Because this is an operation, it's not an expression. Yeah, like that, if you want. Semicolons are optional, okay, but the increase with the And that's it. We don't need to return the object because the object is already being created by the new. We are just filling with information and with the function that we need. And so, if we try this new uh, mechanism, console.log r3, and then we can try to increase the score of our tree and let's print it again and see what happens. Save and run. Yeah, but it's, I hate you. Sometimes it will open automatically, sometimes not. Uh, but we already, we can run it by hand. So what we have here is an object that is called uh, response. Uh, so wait, so let me comment uh, the previous, because we can have a clean Okay, there was a bit of mess on the console. So I created an object and uh, I called the, the function to modify that object. So the effect is the same as before. The only difference is that now in the printout statement, uh, the, the console, but basically the, the, the language, the object remembers how it was created. So it remembers the number, the name, sorry, of the its creator function. So it's not just any object that I create inside the braces. It's an object that has been created by calling response. So it's easier. It's not really the class of that object. There's no notion there. But uh, uh, it's the creator, or is it called also the, the prototype link for that object. Hmm? So it's easier also during the bug to see where this object was created. What kind of audio what I I don't I, I can say what type of object it is because every object has the same type they are just objects but there are objects of different kinds uh, that we can create and can uh, remember that information okay so this is the normal way of using uh, uh, of creating when we need to create some object that we use in our program uh, we can Define, instead of defining a class, we define a creator function that just populates uh, the object. Uh, just remember that a creator function must always uh, be called with new because if we call it without the new keyword, of course, the, the word doesn't explode. But uh, an exception is launched and uh, Let's read this exception. In this statement, it's telling me that uh, uh, sorry, I it's telling me cannot set properties of undefined. What does it mean? Is that in, in this statement we are trying to set property text 
to the object this. But since we didn't call the function with the new operator, there's no object this available. It has not been created. And so I cannot set properties on that. Okay? So from the syntactic point of view, the this keyword requires that we call the function with new. Otherwise, the function will not run. Okay? And if it had to run, also it would not work because there is no return statement in this function. And so that would return undefined. So just remember, and that's what, uh, the reason why we use a capital letter on constructor functions, just to remember to call them with new and lowercase letters on other functions that are, let's say, behave normally, okay? And they can be called normally. So let's put the new inside again. Okay? So this is one usage of dynamic functions. Building closures to create objects. Okay? We have a function that is inside an object and remember the object in which it works. There are other ways, so this is what we're trying to explain in these slides. And with constructor functions, okay. Let's move to another next level, let's say, of usage of these functions, which is, uh, sorry, let me open the file. Uh, another usage of dynamic function, which is basically the, the reverse, that are so-called callbacks. And then we can do some practical exercises on those. Uh, with closures, we have a function that returns a function. Okay? With callbacks, we have a function that accepts a function as its parameters. So instead of generating a new function, you just accept a new function, which is a callback function. A callback function is a function paste, paste is into another function as an argument which is then invoked inside the outer function to complete some kind of action. Okay, again, the definition are always, uh, um, I always, are always difficult okay, to, to, to get. We have a, an example here of a function called the create quote that uh, uh, creates a sentence with a quote as a, an argument, so, okay, I always, like I always say, goodbye, or whatever, and then does something with this uh, string. So it, I create a string, and I want to do something, I want you to do something with this string. Do something means I print it, I store it into the database, I mm, log it somewhere, or whatever. So the function, Create quote knows how to create a string, but doesn't know what to do with it. So what we can do to help this function is to say, okay, after you created the quote, do something with it. And I will provide you a function for doing something with it. So I will provide you an argument, which is the quote that you use to do your concatenation or whatever. And then a second a function. Whenever you're ready, call this function that will do the right thing to the value that you created. And in this case, so I create, this will, I will define a function with one, say, string parameter and one function parameter. When I call this function, and it's a normal function, I pass the first argument, in this case it's a string, and at the second argument, a reference to a function. So it can be a function that they already defined, like this one, it can be a narrow function that is just writing line. It's just a reference to a function, defined in any of the legal ways uh, that we uh, learn to define a function. So this function, the create quote, receives a string and a reference to this function. What it does, is uh, 
we create a string and then here we have a variable that contains a value of type function that can be called with parentheses and when I call a function okay we look at what this object with this parameter is pointing at and right now it's pointing at the log quote which is this function there this receive a parameter quote which is passed here and it just does a console.log so the idea is just you are injecting into the create quote function a behavior by providing a function that will implement that specific behavior. And this is very normal in JavaScript. A lot of programming in JavaScript is uh, using what uh, you would do maybe with generic ties with the inheritance in other languages here is done with callbacks i will teach you how to do it okay these are so-called synchronous callbacks because they just execute synchronous with the call we will then move on to asynchronous callbacks after a while a synchronous callback are, for example you remember the problem with sort that was sorting the number in string order instead of numerical order. Because that is the default implementation of the sort function. But if we want the sort function to behave differently, because maybe we want to sort numbers, or we want to sort objects, and there's some criteria about these objects to be sorted, well, that's easy. We just have to provide to the sort function one argument, which is a comparison function a comparison function and the co a normal comparison function will return a negative null or positive number according to whether the first or element should come first or, or after before or after the, the second argument okay so if we want to sort these as, as numbers we will try to do that uh, we just have uh, to provide a callback to the sort function with uh, a couple of uh, the this callback will have two parameters a and b and the callback will be called by the short short algorithm when and how it wants and how it requires depending on the algorithm we don't care we don't know we know that every time the sorting algorithm needs to compare two elements it will call my function. I will provide two elements of the array that will be used as the argument a and b, and I need to provide, as a result, a number, which is negative null or positive. And if, they, if these are our numbers, okay, this difference can be just the, the result that we want. Okay, a minus b will be negative null or positive. So in this case, we are bypassing or redefining the default mechanism of the sort which would be just convert everything to string and then do a string comparison by providing our own comparison function this function will be called many times we should it should be consistent of course if a b gives a positive number then b a should give a negative number this is our responsibility okay it's like you know comparator functions in java Uh, but instead of creating a comparator object uh, and passing that object there or an instance of the object, we just set the, the function. And in many cases, we don't even need to create the function, define it elsewhere. We if it's easy, we can just define it in line. Okay, so for example, uh, if we want to test the sorting, we can define uh, an array like we did last time with uh, some three, seven, twelve, two, I don't know, twenty three, thirty four, and four, whatever. And we know that. We can print A, 
we can try to sort it. So A dot sort. Sort is a method that modifies the array, doesn't return anything new. Okay? So we call it on the method and it will modify the elements in place. And if you run it, not sort.js. This is the original array, and this is the sorted array that we already know that it's sorted in string order. You want to sort it in a, a numerical order. We provide an argument, which is a callback function, with a, b, two arguments, and you return an expression, in this case, a minus b, like we had in the slides. If we run the program again, we see that now the sorted array is sorted according to the increasing order of numbers. And of course, if we want it to be in decreasing number, we just reverse uh, the comparison. We change the sign, for example. And then it will be in decreasing order. Okay. Pick your choice of, a, of an ordering function. And if we had, uh, let's go back to our objects, okay, an array of the responses, it's an array with R1, R2, and R3. I could think of sorting the responses by decreasing order of score. So it would be responses, the sort. I provide a comparison between two elements, and uh, I need to compare the score of them. So it would be a dot score, sorry, decreasing b dot score minus a dot score. Let's hope it works. Okay, this is what it's printed at the end. It prints one object with score four, another object with score two, and a third object with score two, which is at the same level. Okay, so these two could be in any order. I want to Compare them in other, in other, with other criteria, we just have to, to put the criteria here. By the way, we could be surprised, we are not, that we created objects in different ways and we don't need any getter or setter to access the element. We just go there and play with them. We can use them. You can like it or not, but there's no protection for accessing object properties. And also these objects are, have been created in different ways. The first two are normal object, and the third one is a constructed object by constructor function. And they mix and match normally. As long as they have a score property, they can be used in this way. Maybe the constructor function may also add extra parameters, maybe, you know, the creation date or whatever. We don't need the object to be of the same type. We just need them to have the score property when we try to access that. And even then, depends on this uh, comparator function, because if the score is not defined, this would be not an error, but just an undefined value. And if in my code I check for undefined, I could also maybe sort or handle objects that don't contain maybe the property. Hmm? So there's, still, there's a lot of flexibility here, maybe too much flexibility. And there's a lot of functions that work in this way. So the sorting one is the one that comes from my mind first because we already know it. But uh, uh, one, uh, there's a lot of uh, functions that methods, let's say, that can be applied to arrays that use this uh, paradigm. We call it functional programming sometimes. 
because we are doing operations on arrays, on lists, by providing functions. Hmm? And there's more to it than, uh, there are more to uh, functional programming than just providing functions and arguments. But we'll, we'll see it one piece at a time. For example, the filter. Filter is a method on arrays that creates a new array with a subset of the elements in the previous, in the existing array, in the same order. And the subset is uh, picked uh, by choosing which elements uh, satisfy a given check. For example, and how is this check implemented? How can I specify which properties I want to check? By providing a callback function. So for example, here I have a, a list of three objects. And here I'm calling Market is the name of the list. I'm calling the filter method on the list, and I'm providing a function as argument. The result will be a new list with a copy of the same objects, a subset of these objects. And in this case, it will return only the object whose uh, stock is the, so it's a callback function, okay? So a callback will receive an argument, and we, can, we may call it as we want. We can make call it the x, y, stock, or whatever. And uh, here we have the value that the callback is returning. And this value could be true or false, will be interpreted as, as true or false. In this case, I'm returning true whenever the value has the var um, attribute less than zero. So I'm returning, I'm selecting, I'm filtering for the elements whose variation is negative. So I take an object, have a look at it, say, are you negative? Yes. So you will be included in the result. And of course, it's positive. They will be, uh, all the other ones will be included. Okay, so whenever you have a list and you need to select some elements from that list without modifying the original list, you can use a filter. And if your filter condition is uh, complex, you can chain filter operations. Because the result of filter is an array. So you, can, you could also add the market.filter and a condition on the variation, dot .filter again, and another callback that operates maybe on some other attributes or some other conditions. The idea of functional programming is that uh, it never modifies any variable that you have, it never modifies any array. All the operation that you do will create new arrays, and this can be manipulated over and over again. Don't, don't be scared of the idea of creating new arrays, okay? It doesn't mean copying the elements, it's just copying the reference of the elements. So if this array contains three objects and these objects have a lot of attributes or complex or they're nested attributes or whatever, when we do a filter, you just get a new array object that contains the same items inside, the reference to the same items. It's a shallow copy. Okay, we are not uh, bad the element, uh, the first element of bed is also the first element of market. If we, if we modify bed.name also in the first element, uh, so bed0.name equal to something else, it would also modify this name. So this object is not a copy of that object. It's the same object, just remember. So that's a lightweight operation. You just create a new container for the same object with a different in this case, in a different selection, or in a different order, whatever. Okay, so they are not expensive operations. If we if we are creating every time, we are just creating the container. And an array in JavaScript is very light. Uh, it's very light because it's one of the the most optimized data structures. So this is the basis for this paradigm of uh, functional programming that we'll see now 
when working with arrays, so we learn different ways of doing array operations, but we will revisit it in a much larger scope when we do React programming, where this program is used also for doing bigger things. The idea is that uh, what we just wrote, array.filter, is a simple replacement for the C-like uh, loop uh, that you may have written until yesterday. I create a new array, I take one element at a time, I check these elements according to a given function, and then, if needed, I can push the new element into the array. This is what we do. Basically, all of the code is just uh, boilerplate code to handle the, the iteration. The only intelligent, the only logic is here, defining which is the filter condition. And all the iteration mechanism is already handled by the filter itself, by the filter method itself. So we only need to focus on what is important. I want to filter, and what is the criteria for, fi for, uh, for filtering? That's it. We cannot do anything wrong there. By the way, this is wrong because this should be an of, not in. Hmm? So it's also an opportunity for inserting bugs here. So it's more compact, more readable, likely also more efficient than handling the iteration by hand. It just takes a while no, to, to parse because uh, this will be a function that is defined here and will be called uh, inside the filtering, while here we are, we are calling the filter ourselves, okay? But that will be probably defined somewhere else. So uh, when we're talking about functional programming, it means that we are not afraid of using functions like any other object, like we have been doing this uh, last uh, 45 minutes or whatever. Um, Some people call, uh, use the term higher order functions uh, uh, by talking about functions that operate on functions. But we are not doing a lot of this uh, uh, in, in this course. Uh, the idea is that uh, you can get a function and modify in some way this function and return a new function that does the same thing as before, but more or in a different way, like in decorators that we have in other programming languages. Hmm? Um, but the idea is having a lot of little functions and try to compose them in order to get the result that you want. And the idea, for example, for the arrays is that all of these functions, first of all, are pure functions. So they never modify their arguments. They return something else. And what they return, in most cases, is of the same kind, of the same type, as the object they were called on. And so you can chain these calls in sequence. Hmm? Um, the, the warning that we have is that uh, we should accept that functions uh, should never or should not modify their arguments, their object. Okay, so if we are forced to say, okay, but I for example, I want to increase or make, you know, compute something about this, uh, maybe increase by one, all of these uh, variation numbers, like we did with the scores before. So our temptation would be, okay, let's iterate over the elements and increase the score, the, the variation of each of them. Okay, that is possible, but it's not something that can be chained or can be used in a functional way. In a functional way, we create a new array where these elements are copied with modifications. I will create a copy of this uh, object and then, but while copying it, I will modify something that we want. You remember, we did something of copying an object with modification using the spread operator. Let's copy it, but I overwrite a property. And that would be a good way of doing that. It's 
it seems strange at the beginning, but then we'll become fluent and we'll be happy for, for the efficiency of coding. So what are the main uh, uh, functional programming primitives uh, that are predefined for arrays? So let's play a bit with those. Uh, just this. One we already encountered, it's called filter. There's, uh, but let's see them in, uh, in, um, in order. For each, the, the replacement of the for loop. For each is just is the simplest one. It takes every element of the array and calls the callback on that element without expecting anything in return. So this callback may print the element, may modify it, may create a new data structure, whatever. It's just a, a way of calling a function for each and every element of an array, replacing the for of hmm, uh, statement. Then every and some are uh, Boolean functional methods. So these functional methods return a true or false. How many times you do write a loop with a flag to check whether there is at least an element uh, with this property? Do we have at least one negative number in the list and so on? Or are all the number, all the strings uh, defined or whatever? So usually we define a loop with a, with, a, with a flag that from true may become false and vice versa. Okay, uh, we forget about the writing those kind of loops. We have this functional every and sum that call, that check on every element and every returns true only if uh, all the elements uh, pass the check. So the callback function returns true for every element and sum returns true if at least one element uh, satisfies the property. Um, the result of the every and sum is a Boolean, so it's no longer an array, so you cannot change it with something else. Usually you put them into an if or something like that. Hmm? And then the two more useful function operators are filter and map that uh, take an array and return a new array. The difference is that uh, filter creates uh, an array with a subset of the same element. So what changes is the number of elements that it returns. What it doesn't change is the objects themselves, the elements. Hmm? Map is the other way around. It returns an array with the same length as the initial one but the objects are changed. They create, I'm creating a new array of the same length where one by one I'm mapping the old elements into the new array. And mapping means copying them, but it would be useless, or modifying them in some way, or creating something entirely new based on some, some objects. So I'm transforming an array into another array where I'm applying a transformation function to each element independently from the other. So every element will de determine what is in the other array. The result will be an array, so on this result can, we can filter, we can do uh, other maps uh, or whatever. And the more complex one, it's not used a lot, uh, except for maybe computing sums and averages, is the reduce function. Oh, well, it doesn't... Uh, allow for a simple explanation in words. Okay, we need to, we need to sit uh, with more detailed uh, explanation. So, for example, uh, let's take our program here where we had these three objects, okay? We have three objects that we created in some uh, strange way, but here they are. So, what I can do for example, if instead of writing just a console.log, I want to do, you know, print uh, the scores. Okay, so for printing the scores uh, or printing a message, a nicely formatted message, okay, not just a console.log. So, okay, I could write a for of loop like we already did, or just saying that the responses, 
dot uh, uh, for each for each element we do something do something for each element what do we do well let's define a callback that does the thing so the callback takes one parameter which is the element let's say the response r and then does something okay so just remember here we are providing one single value which is the reference to a function for compactness we define a function in line with the arrow syntax but of course we need if the function has a body <laughs> with with more than one line and we need space for writing the function so we have this closed brace and then the closed parenthesis sorry which is unusual in other languages just remember the braces are part of the syntax for creating the function and then the parenthesis is the call of for each this is the argument of the callback function that is the individual element of the array and we want to print them nicely we said okay console.log and then write a template string with uh, uh, by writing uh, uh, response r dot text as score r dot score so i'm doing something with that i can modify value I can use the value I print by printing it and uh, I could also use this value for modifying other data structures so this is not a, something that I would normally do I, I not, would not normally su uh, suggest but maybe uh, I just want to record the scores somewhere so no, nothing pre prevents me from doing uh, scores dot push uh, r dot scores. I'm not suggesting to do this. No, I would do that with a field, uh, with a map. But just to understand how it works, I'm defining a function here that in this case okay it works with r does something with r which is its own parameter so nothing strange but here it's also using scores which is a reference to an outside variable so this callback has a closure over the scores variable it's a short-lived closure because in some way when we finish the for each iteration the, this arrow function will disappear will be forgotten and so its closure references will also be forgotten of course we don't forget scores because it's defined at the top level hmm? but the strange thing or maybe complicated at first is that these callbacks usually are very deeply nested functions but they have the visibility over the context in which they are called okay so it should also print all the scores let's save it and try it so we should print nice messages for the three objects and then respond a response abc a score four x with and so on and then we have this array of scores that has been also computed and printed okay so depending on what we need to do instead of writing a for of loop we can use the for each for it doesn't return anything so we can change it or can that return any, any value hmm? but as I said I wouldn't probably compute scores in this way because in some way hmm, defeats the functional aspects of this function because a, a pure function should not have any side effects over its parameter or even worse over its context so if I really need uh, an array with the scores, that is the perfect job for map. 
I wouldn't write this here. I wouldn't define scores there. I would just define the scores as a transformation of the responses. It's a new array with the same elements, the same number of elements as the, as the responses, but for every response element, we need to create a new object, which is just simply the score. It's simply a number in this case. So it's uh, responses dot map. So the map takes a function, so it takes an array, and applies a transformation function to each element of this array. So for example, we have a single response, and we return the callback function, we return how the object will be transformed. In this case, we just extract the number. So it will be just r.score. I drop the parenthesis because there's only one argument and there's only one expression. And that would provide, of course, the same result. Here I can return what I want. In this case, it's just a, a number, but I, I could create objects, for example, with uh, points uh, or stars, contains the score, and uh, it will create, uh, sorry, why is it undefined? Yeah, sorry. Uh, there's a syntax. I, I want to return an object, okay? So I need to create the braces. But in the syntax, the braces are confused for the body of the function. So in order to return an object, I need to put a parenthesis to say, okay, this is an expression, and the value of the expression is an object. Because otherwise, it would execute this uh, instruction star equal uh, and then return nothing. So, okay. So in this case, I'm creating a new array with new objects inside, and these objects are just a transformation, a mapping of the existing ones. The only limitation we can create, we can create what you want. The only limitation is that inside here, you only know about the current element. You don't know about what is before, the previous or the next element. So that's why I say that map and filter are the complement to each other. Filter doesn't change the element, but let you select them. Map doesn't let you select anything. You get everything, but you can modify them in some way. Hmm? And, uh, okay, so these. The, these callbacks are also more Say, complex because, for example, we in for each we only use the current value. Actually, we can use more than one. There, are, the callback will be given more than one parameter, so it can also know how the index uh, can also have a reference to the original array if we want to do something with the index. We just uh, define a callback with more than one parameter, and this parameter will be passed. Remember last time that we said that it's not an error to have a function with less or more parameter than are passed, and this is one of the cases. If we just need the first value. We do like we did. If we needed also maybe the index, uh, for example, the position, uh, we accept a second argument in our callback, and we use it, for example, as an indexing number, i plus 1, like that. And we use the second argument which is the index 0, 1, 2, we use it to print it or to something. The, for each method doesn't know what we are doing. It always gives me three values. The current element, its index, and a reference to responses, the array on which it's being called. 
And if I need them, I just need to define more parameters in my callback and that use the values. If I don't define them, more, they will be passed and thrown away. It's not an error. Okay, so imagine just put, sit inside this function, say, okay, what I'm getting here is a value and a number that represents the index of the value inside the, uh, the array. And uh, map, uh, uh, no, map only receives uh, one parameter, I, I think. Okay, so in this case, we are mapping an array and integer of other array integers where we have this computing the square, for example, or we convert the letter into uppercase or whatever we want. Okay, and filter, as we said, uh, just returns a subset, what we already uh, saw. And the other two basic functions are, uh, like we said, every and some that. Uh, implement the loops for finding uh, whether all the elements have a given property or all the elements, or at least one element as a, so every is the for all test, whether all elements in the array pass the test and the test is implemented by the callback. So it's a sort of a for each, works like in the for each, every element, every element the, for every element the function is called, normally this function doesn't, is not expected to modify anything, but just to check the value and return true or false. So in this case, uh, is it true that every element in array A is less than 10? Yes. One is less than 10, two is less than 10, three is less than 10. So every time I call this uh, callback with a new value of X, uh, which is iterated over the different values, uh, I was, the result will always be true. So in a way we have true, 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 and uh, the every function returns true in its turn. In this case, uh, there are some elements uh, which are not uh, even numbers, and so the callback will return false sometimes, and that will force the every method to return false on its turn. By the way, in this case, I, the iteration is not completed. So as soon as I do the check on the first element, uh, the condition is already false, uh, and the iteration is stopped. Uh, we don't need to go to the end. In fact, if an, an element is found, it immediately turns false without completing the iteration, like any same person in the room would do. And sum is just a complement. Uh, it returns false uh, if all of them are false, and it returns true if only one of them is true. Of course, you can transform uh, one and the other just by complementing the, uh, the condition. And so again, it's a um, one-liner instead of a loop uh, with a new variable. Uh, and we never know how to name these uh, Boolean flag variables and so on. And here, we, the nice part is that the local variables are just uh, parameters. So their name doesn't uh, remain. We don't need to define a new variable, it's just a temporary name that only, is only valid inside uh, that callback function. So the code remains cleaner. Okay, so I think the last point would be to meet the reduce function, which is the strangest of the, of the, of the lot, which is uh, something to take a list of values and compute one summary value out of out of them. So usually I use reduce when I need to do the sum of an array. You remember that there is no sum uh, uh, function in the standard library. So when we, in the first week when we needed to compute an average, we needed to sum the numbers uh, with a for loop, okay? And uh, reduce can do that in a functional way. Uh, the so reduce is applied to an array, and the callback function contains uh, at least uh, two parameters. One the second parameter is the current value. So each element that we are iterating on. And the other is the 
accumulated count, accumulated value. Um, let's imagine you just want to, to do a sum, okay? We have the scores, which is an, an array of numbers. So let's call the total scores. So the total scores, cost total, can be computed by repeating an operation on every element and uh, putting together the results. So it's uh, scores dot uh, reduce. So let's have a look uh, at the documentation here. It says that reduce receives a callback function. This callback function takes, parenthesis, previous value, current value, current index, and a reference to the array. Or, uh, what is the initial, okay, sorry. And, sorry. Uh, and a second parameter there's another format so in this format the reduce only gets one parameter the callback okay that contains uh, all of this information and returns a value there's another format uh, which is uh, basically mandatory where we have two parameters one is the callback function as before and the other is the initial value And uh, this one, I don't know what variant is. Uh, yeah, it's an initial value with another type. So the idea is, we have two parameters. Let's want to do a, a, just the sum, okay? So we start with zero. The second parameter is the initial value. And at every operation, at every iteration, what do we do? We take the previous sum and add the current number. So the callback receives two parameters, which is the previous value of the sum, let's call it S, and the current element, E, current, C. And what we do is to return S plus C. Okay, sorry, the microphone died. Okay, so let's, uh, let's repeat what we're writing here. So we are, the reduce function, the reduce method, starts from an initial value, which is the second parameter, and then gets a, a callback function as the third parameter that will be iterated on every element. So we start, in this case, S is the, cumulative value and sees the current value, as the sum and sees the current value. So at the first element, uh, or before the iteration, S is initialized to zero. Then on the first element, uh, we get S, which is e equal to zero, and C, which is four, the first element. Oh, okay, well, let's see, yes, just use the the array of numbers, not, the, not of objects, okay? It's the same, but it will be a bit more complicated. So we have the array of scores, four, two, two. And so the first time S is zero and C is four. And we return four plus zero, which is zero, that will be stored, stored in S, in the next, uh, in the sum, the value of the sum for the next iteration. So the next iteration will receive four as the sum and two as the value. And we compute four plus two, which is six. And six will be the value of the sum for the next iteration, for the third one, with C equal to two. 
and we compute 6 plus 2, 8. There are no further elements, so the 8 is the result of the reduced method, if everything is right. Console.log, total. Save, and try. 8. Okay, so from an array of elements, we only compute one value. And this value is computed by putting together the contributions of each element. So computer sum, computing a multiplication. It's in a sort is a generalization of every and sum. Because every and some take each element, compute a function, then do the end of all this function or the or of all this function. In general, we can do any operation that will depend on the partial value computed up to now plus the current element. There are many operations that can be written this way. So I think it's less intuitive because it requires you to think about the iteration is not just an element by element uh, uh, operation, okay? But uh, especially for this pattern here, SC gives S plus C, it comes very easily in mind. Uh, just remember that we have a second parameter which is the initial value. If we don't provide initial value, I don't remember what happens. So in this case, uh, is still working, so probably the, there's a default value, there is some, uh, default value which is good, but I would also, especially with the strength things that, uh, by the way, let's play a game. If the initial value is a string, is it an empty string? It will print 4 to 2, because S will be a string, and this S plus C will be interpreted as string concatenation. It's only at runtime that we'll check the types and do and decide what to do with this uh, plus operation. Okay, so it's always better to be to be explicit because otherwise the default maybe we don't like it. Okay. Okay, so I think there's uh, quite uh, a bit of material there. We'll try maybe to do some exercises uh, at least. Uh, uh, using or writing some of this uh, um, code that were proposed in exercise eight, three in the next hour and then we'll try to leave some some time at the end also for starting to see the next step which is uh, the asynchronous callbacks huh? but first we need to <laughs> to get familiar with the synchronous ones so we can have a 15 minute break okay